But hi, everybody. Um, thank you very much for joining us for this hour of ideas. So I'm very fortunate um, to um, be sitting next to Gorilla, actually, who's been doing this massive crowdsourcing um, task of ideas with our patrons and um, other people. And it's been a fabulous experience, and he's smiling and enjoyed it so much. Can't wait to do it again. <laughs> so, um, so we're just going to quickly do a really quick introduction. We need beginners, beginners Institute. Very, very fortunate to be here. Uh, we have a health and safety slide, and I'm just going to put up the two seconds just to reaffirm to everyone what to do. Um, I want to acknowledge um, we've got two new patrons, which is fantastic. Um, one in the room, Jess, and, and Nikki, who's up in Auckland. Um, and it's because, you know, we, we try to recalibrate and rethink about what we want to be doing in the future. And um, both um, Nikki and Jess are um, critically important for kind of some of the thinking and ideas and projects that we want to work on. Um, and I'd like to add that this um, process that Gorilla and I have been through is also about trying to actually understand when we would get some traction. You know, we 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 see exciting stuff today um, on the edge. So um, it's a wonderful opportunity to introduce you um, to Nikki and Jess if you haven't met them. This is just gives you a list of um, uh, the patrons that are in New Zealand, and Jess is our first one based in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. um, in New Zealand. But the idea is that they initially were patrons. Um, I didn't want to actually have a board, probably because they might cost me around too much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, but what I did want was, you know, you can't know everything. You need your ideas tested all the time. So, um, and your process is tested. And um, so I really needed this particular type of people that would actually help us shape and um, basically optimize the space that we've got and the opportunity to speak. And we're really lucky we've got Morgan Williams here and we've got Jess here as well joining us. And um, a lot of patrons online, as you can see, they are around the country. So um, welcome. I know um, Roger's there and Michelle's there and Nikki's there. And um, I think Paul Moran was going to try to count me overseas. He's going to do the same. But um, yeah, so um, thank you very much. What I wanted to say um, is that we did a crowdsourcing exercise of ideas. So we basically used the final concept of just trying to get as many different ideas as possible. And that's, um, that led to some um, amazing conversations with patrons. And um, they continued in um, it's kind of in a very different way. We normally ask for asking them to help me with something really specific, you know. Um, but this was actually um, a really open conversation about saying, well, what are the things that you're saying? What are you thinking about? What's happening in your communities? What's, you know, um, so they were very um, open um, questions. And I'd like to add that I had tsunamis of emails about like, with people sending me ideas. Um, over the last probably 36 hours. So it's kind of like we opened something in, in the dialogue of better and more intense, which was um, fantastic. And so we've, um, so I don't want to tell you what time I was putting the ideas in, the last ideas that was coming I through. <laughs> but anyway, so um, it was, so you can imagine this massive process. And the idea is, I think, is that we probably don't spend a lot of time trying to just think and seek ideas. We spend a lot of time in analyzing the ideas that we like. Okay, so this idea is about actually trying to test the process. Um, so when, to be honest, I was quite sort of not not naive, not, not that thing I was naive, girl, but we got all these ideas, and then Carol and I were like looking at each other. Well, Carol said, Well, what should we do now? And um, she had a solution, like he always does. Do you want to talk about that? Yes, uh, when you have 1,000 suggestions that come through, you can either prepare a laundry list, uh, which is very ugly, or uh, you can say, what are the big themes that uh, emerge from this set of ideas? The good news is they are all converging, whether we talk to each other, whether we look around the world, whether we talk to the public sector, as you know now, 
The big themes are around the environment, biosphere and related concerns. There's a lot of concern about uh, social issues, social cohesion and such like. One of the big things that emerged, and we'll come back to some of the themes that sort of are getting a lot of voice is threats to democracy. Uh, this is becoming a big deal. The university is also involved with public sector talking about what are the big things they want to talk about, threats to democracy, um, misinformation, disinformation, social media are becoming big ideas. And then there are the others. So the, um, we organize those around those cross-cutting themes, long-term governance issues, democracy and related matters, uh, social cohesion, in other words, we have over 250 plus uh, ethnicities living in this beautiful country. Are we still able to live, breathe, pray, play together in, in, in a civilized way and travel together? Uh, biosphere is a broader term to environment, water, um, climate and everything else. Workforce talks about skilling uh, our people, but it's more than that. It's about making sure that everybody is a stakeholder in this whole thing, right? Because a lot of people are walking away from it. Uh, and the key issue is how do you make sure that these people feel that they are part of the family of New Zealand, as it were, that's the big idea. Welfare and tax system, people always talk about welfare system, tax system separately. We are saying you know, that's not the right way to do it. There's an integrated thing. And then of course, prosperity. Uh, material comfort, material prosperity. If you use economic growth, people get emotional and they say degrowth, lack growth, may growth, whatever. We're talking about making people comfortable. So if you want transport, you can do it by walking, by cycling, by driving an electrical car if you can afford it, or by driving a fossil fuel car. But we do need transport. So that's a, a material comfort. We do need housing. We need we need uh, 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 clothing to wear, we need food and such. So that's our social yes. <laughs> So those are the big things. So so we got the um Garou got the cross cutting things. And then was you know, so then you think, well, how, you know, where, where do we go next in this process? Um and what was so interesting was it was almost like the cross cutting things was people holding on to a cloth. So it was we it was pulling and creating tension. So it's almost like kind of an idea that you could actually um you know sit like arm and walk through a sit, you know, then this concept that you'd actually created kind of a network of things. And so then we um then we had a play around with trying to make this decision about well we we use this term um, policy actions. We had a discussion about the difference between an idea. And a policy action. Um, we had a play around with using the term policy response, but we liked the term action because we felt it was um, much more in tone with what we were trying to do. So, what were those clear actions that could be done? And could we then turn around and start putting these ideas and build them up into the action? And we had quite a lot of discussion around how. You know what would be the win wins? How you know this idea that it wasn't any good just to get an idea. We actually wanted to mix it up with another idea, and we wanted to craft it into something. So, in other words, that we that we use the cross cutting things to um, stress test our thinking to actually try and make something that was stronger. And I use the term a win win press. So, in other words, we got more value, more gain because we had this washing machine of ideas, we suddenly could actually start actually building and crafting something that, and, and this is what we've had a go at, we're not over-promising on this, are we, no. uh, we've had this discussion, so help, help me this, so, um, so that's what, so we've got um, seven big policy options, and they, um, and we, we wanted to, we've got a little idea about how you have some discussion points about how we could, um, Make that happen. We've got the short read and the long read. Um, um, kudos to Michelle who actually says this, this might be a very good idea, and um, and it's worked very well. I think. Okay. 
And the idea is that uh, this is out now and we have a much longer document. We have got Oxen here, this thick little beast here, full of references, um, which the patrons are very good at sending supporting evidence. So thank you very much for that. And the idea is that um, this will be published properly in about, um, I'd say, you'd say mid-March. And this is sort of published now. But we will continue to work on this and then we'll publish them both in March as we do in the line process. But this one is the only one that's a hard copy, and this one's a soft copy. So um, so that so that was kind of the concept of that. And if we just really quickly, we'll go through this quite quickly. You've got the preface, the beautiful cone of Paul's Wilson, which we can go past, it's so great. Um, you've got the diagrams, then you've got a discussion on each of the policy actions. Um, this one is peak climate ready. And then we go through, some of them are very big, that we've actually grouped the ideas into topics, which is really helpful. I think you will find that terribly helpful. Um, and then some of them are quite small, but quite sort of punched in their own right. So um, we'll just quickly go through the rest of those, just so that we get right to the end of it. So there's seven of them that we go through. Um, and then we'll go back to the um, diagram that's got them all out. So we'll just go through, right. And that's, we've just got a little implementation sheet this way from the back. We really can get some ideas on that because obviously you might have a great, um, great big um, policy action you know, ideas, super ideas, but if you can't implement it, what are you in the business doing? So we really wanted to emphasize that when we looked at particular projects and looked at history, implementation became a really critical aspect to be taken into consideration. So this is discussion points. And this is going to pass it back to Carol. Do you want to talk about these? Because I thought this might be the most, we thought this might be the most interesting and useful aspect of this because yeah instead of giving a lecture and boring you to death. Uh, I think it's good to have a conversation. And uh, the conversation is around, first of all, note that this is not a polished policy document written by a group of super expert policy analysts. This is a tapestry of wisdom uh, that is pulled together from the conversations and the inputs of the passionate people who are all experts in their field and who think what they are expert on and passionate about is the be all and end all of life. That's why when he was sending, he takes at 3.40 a.m. in the morning saying, can we have a chat? What do you think about this? I say maybe at 5.30 would be better. <laughs> in any case, so uh, that's one point I wanted to make. The second thing is uh, in choosing those big, big ideas or action points, uh, we had three dimensions or criteria in mind. Was, one was systemic. Uh, a lot of people are using their beautiful expertise to dig into their areas, which is fine. That's how it should be. What are the big systemic issues? In other words, things we can focus on that will have a benefit for all those cross-cutting teams, at least collectively. Second, interconnected. In other words, pick areas which if you do something, then it will benefit and the outcomes will be related. For example, if you deal with poverty, you're also improving social cohesion. You're also improving in the long run productivity uh, and on it goes. And the third is uh, which of these are most amenable to inclusive processes? Um, what we found in all of these cases is they are all messy, to use jargon, they are wicked problems. You cannot press a button in Wellington and solve the mental health issue in Kaita or uh, deal with the environmental degradation around the country. It's not like the Reserve Bank raising the official cash rate, cost of credit, price of credit goes up, people spend less, maybe inflation on the demand side. It's linear. None of the issues we are dealing with are of this sort. The final point I want to make, and then we'll open it to discussion, we want to have a separate, distinct conversation about whether what we picked are the big areas we need to focus on and separate it from the how. To give you an example, 
if you agree that giving more voice to young people is the right thing to do, given that they are walking on the streets of the world protesting about climate change and all that, they are engaged. If you want them to engage with our democratic processes and you want to give them more voice, that's the outcome. The next question is, is what we are proposing, reduce the age of voting to 16, the best intervention to achieve that? It may not be the case, we don't mind, right? So separate those out. So with that preamble, I think I'll put in my limits. <laughs> now we can talk about uh, the most discussed items, the most contentious ones, uh, most difficult to write, I don't know, challenging and comprehensive. So when Wendy and I were talking about, about one of the things that we noticed that the most discussed is uh, I find anyway is the emerging threat threat to democracy, for example. So you have something else. Um, oh gosh, you keep going. Okay. I'll have, I'll... So so that's sort of a, an area we want to talk about. Are you feeling that equivalent at the same level of concerns about climate change, biosphere concerns, that the threat to democracy is emerging as a big conversation point in this country? The second one is about, of all the things we are talking about, which is the most contentious? We found that uh, reducing the age of voting to 16, we seem to pick as one of the most contentious ones, for example. So we want to have a conversation about that. And now I will shut up and you will talk, please. And you can say anything you want. You don't have to applaud us. You can say the, the seven topics you picked are totally uh, tangential. They are irrelevant or whatever. Do you want to say anything? Else? Um, I might just quickly go through the seven because you might find yes, it very difficult to see. Um, but it, um, my team might just pass. Could you pass the booklet out to people that are in the room? Because I think that I know some of you have got it, but right. Um, so basically, um, the seven were um, peak climate meeting, I'm going to pass it on, um, here, oak um, security, which is basically everything that I'm speaking. Um, invest forward, the vote 16, establish the ecological corridors and the erosion policy. So you can kind of see that they, they are actually different sides of the same coin. Um, and then um, it's recorded future fit. And uh, that was the last one and the most difficult to um, give a title to. So I thought um, that might be useful to understand that we have quite a lot of dialogue and actually Jess um, solved that for us um, about um, 24 hours ago. Um, and that was calling it future fit because what we wanted to do was not, we had a concern around prioritizing the future, even though that's obviously what we wanted to do. But we didn't want to prioritize it for seats pretty soon. So we meet the future fit. So I just wanted, I thought it would give you an insight into the types of discussions and it's a way of thinking just as well for um, solving that for us. So um, and I, I just wanted to finish. So the most difficult to write was the um, territory, but one because you actually do feel quite people today about stepping up or causing harm unnecessarily. You go into the space, and I think that's kind of quite new. I wouldn't have found it so difficult even five years ago. Um, and I think that was a space that was quite difficult for all the patrons because everyone wants to, you know, do the right thing, and it's just sometimes it's hard to know what the right thing would like we need to use. So I just thought I would put that on the table. Um, and uh, the most challenging horizon discussion was actually with Morgan, who's in the room. And that was around the fact um, I was sort of, you know, my preface that um, Daryl and I played around with was the concept that 2040 became terribly important because it was both the um, two entities of the technology. And also um, when all the IPCC reports basically say things really hit. But Morgan, would you like to just quickly respond to um, your comment to me on this? Uh, a little bit of context, perhaps. 
Wendy and I have a chat on the phone the other day. The thing is that I, I currently sit on the phone here as standing for the advisory panel, which is a group of six of us that I'm going to speak and assist. You might need to speak out of sight. Assist in yeah. our frontier, our biggest agricultural and food business, global industry, which you all know about. It's got some enormous challenges. So, where it fits in New Zealand's ecology, New Zealand's sociology, global food chains, the list goes on and on. But one of the things that is most challenging is uh, if you've been in the realm of big system changes, and as many of in this room have, and look at the evidence on recognition of the need to shift the system and the policies for investment practices or whatever to do it, the average is somewhere between 15 and 20 plus years for most significant system shifts ones that really matter. And we're talking here about several ten years. And so that then took me back to saying, well, and this is this view comes from a study tour I took to the city in South America to achieve it in Brazil 20 years ago, where they were looking at how they dealt with long-term problems. And they talked about the journey that is a series of steps like climbing a mountain. So if your budget's tight, you shorten the step. But the significant part always was that if you've got a long-term goal, talk about it in terms of steps every living. Otherwise, it's tomorrow. It's too yeah. far. And that's my worry about having three to four million big lights. New Zealand's done a lot of that and has not actually worked out how it takes the 2040 steps to actually get there. So we need to be talking, I think, about staircase and it's not together. It's actually it's a survival or a ramp or something like that. And go and look at examples of where communities have done that successfully. And interestingly enough, that city in Brazil is one such example. The reason is its government structure and its knowledge base and who shared it finally about the city. Uh, and it's very much like in terms of where it is the size of the state. And it's had a third of the GDP and many features it's a way big. So, so, so you heard me going upstairs very steeply and, and, yes. and my um, as I went to sleep that night, so you know, very memorable conversation. Um, Connell, I just wanted to see if you would talk a little bit about your bridging social capital, talking about stairs and bridges. Um, because that I found fascinating. And then I thought, then we'll open it up for discussions. So I'm trying to do it again. I'm going to remember what, what I said there. Um, I was going to say something, um, um, actually, which bounces off that. So thank you. And what was just said is actually a potential solution to it. one of the, the challenges for what's in here. Part of the issue, like, something here is fantastic. But a lot of the big ideas have this way up. There are long, list of stuff and if you hand if you hand that to a politician, politician or to anyone and you see a sort of page of, of things you could do you lose it you could tighten this up a lot without doing anything by actually having in addition to that what would you do in the first year of government something which just says you know for to keep some of the long ones up front these are the first steps um so to lift it out um, I actually can't remember what I said specifically about the social capital. I mean, I think. I can remind you. Yeah. Because <laughs> we were. Well, remind, remind me first. I, I understand the thing here that, that social recognition is such a big issue. Well, my initial thing, which I said, was I thought this was the single big issue. It's a big issue because we don't fix it, we cannot fix uh, um, anything else, right? Our ability to adapt to climate change, or had some tax example in the news last night, right? Our ability to do anything about climate change actually depends on the ability to sustain social consensus. Social consensus that climate change is happening. Right and A lot about technological developments and communications, communications media, social media are pulling us very, very strongly out of the way. 
So I think my initial email to, to Bill and Wendy was basically, well, I think social cohesion, just to quote Paul Krugman, in a sense, it's not every, it's social cohesion is everything, but it almost is this context. If you don't fix that, none of the other big ideas are going to help go off. I can read you what you sent me at 2 a.m. <laughs> social media is to social capital as the chainsaw is to a rainforest, a way of converting a public good into a private income stream, eliminating in doing so the underlying capital stock. So we should take it extremely seriously, is your point. And because uh, I read that and started shivering, I immediately put it into the doctor's <laughs> So I think it covers the context, although obviously there's lots of other things that we would um, talk to. But Garul, should we open up? I think we should open up to a conversation and say, are we focusing on the right big things here? The what? And uh, then we can talk about any irritations you have about the how. In other words, yes, give more voice to young people, but making 16 uh, the voting age is a stupid idea, for example. But let's focus on the what. Are we focused on the big things in the context of uh, when these lists is to, to be big? It has to have some criteria. It has to have impact. It has to have scale. It has to be, it has to be inclusive processes and so on, which we highlight in the document. Are we missing anything major is the big, big deal. I have one question, Carol, and that was the creation of wealth. Yeah. Because the more wealthy you deal in the innovation, the more resources we've got to address all these other things that would cost. Right? So the question is, how do you do that? So you look at Norway, now, ostensibly, Norway um, is doing all the right things, processing electric cars, blah, 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 but actually it's got all its wealth from gas and oil exploration, and then it sees the moral high ground funded by that. Um, those sort of discussions, like at one level, we've got a moratorium on drilling for oil. Now, don't throw stone down. But if that revenue was deployed to address poverty across the nation, which is the big speed, you know, that, that discussion is it's not only interesting, it is a discussion, in my view, we must have uh, without any emotion. But whenever you talk about wealth creation, people always say, oh, growth, degrowth, anti growth, my mother in law's growth. And you go into all this emotional stuff. What you're trying to do, which is fantastic, is to say we need to give people material comfort. You mean we need to make sure that they live good lives in a material, comfortable sense. Can we not create wealth in a way that's also cohesive with our social fabric as well as the environment and all that? Why aren't we not having this conversation instead of throwing mud around neoliberalism, communism? This is a that is a kind of in any case, that's my thing. Let's have a conversation about that, which is a fantastic point. Any other perspectives on that particular point, which is a nice vein to open a conversation with, please? I was just going back to your original themes in the panel yeah. and picking up on your point about making people comfortable and you know, prosperity and stress and wealth and tax integration maybe it's part of the same sort of general theme about people that get the basics. Um, that doesn't seem to feature as being into one of the those seven ideas. So there seems to be a lot of focused on climate, sort of related environmental sort of concerns. Um, Where we did pick it up is uh, uh, when we talked about the um, uh, invest forward. Exactly. Invest forward, where we talk of maybe I'm missing your point, but we did talk about uh, having an integrated welfare and tax system yeah. conversation where you can tax unused, unutilized land and use the revenue from it in a very hypothecated way, in other words, ring-fenced way, yeah. to establish a fund for children from poorer families 
So that uh, that's the equivalent of a superannuation fund. The question is, why are we looking after all the elderly people and not caring as much about the babies whose circumstances are dominating their whole life and inviting people to think that way? Again, the idea is the what. Yeah. How you do it, we can always debate that, right? For example, the, the land tax of that sort may not generate enough income, for example, and there are all kinds of other issues. But nevertheless, the big idea is welfare tax system in an integrated way and thinking about intergenerational equity. Yeah. That's yeah. in that context. And I see kind of that you're talking about like growing and talent and yeah. um, skills side of things as well. Because uh, when a child becomes 18, uh, you can dictate what they can use that for. It could be for further education. It could be building a small business. It could be uh, buying a home and such like. We can still ring fence. But we are trying to divorce the current circumstances into which a child is born from the rest of their life, which uh, is, is a big, big thing. The shadow of the current circumstances is extremely long. Any other sort of, I mean, we don't have to talk only about what Mark raised. A any other big things that you want to say you missed that or I don't like this or something? Yes, please, Donna. Um, thanks, Donna. Thanks, Wendy. Um, so obviously, I have read this, but I guess the thing that comes to my mind straight away if I'm presenting this to political parties or you know whichever government um, comes in obviously the idea of releasing it early is to, to get ahead of the manifesto <laughs> but when I look at it the immediate question to me is to what end what, what like so these seven things are going to give us a lot quite to be because to me I mean we've been working in this space you know trying to get uh different ministers and um you know, even just trying to get engagement with the different policy teams. Uh, and at the end of the day, it's being able to give them a vision of what it is that you're trying to achieve. Um, so this, each of these seven areas will take you to this place. is probably going to be the thing that really engages and, and um, motivates them to adopt. On your own, the seven things they all they all uh, are important, but it's the collective story of what it will give us. Um, and, and you know, we talk about this a lot when you know, I know obviously, you know, not just talk about vision and we talk about you know, what is it that everyone wants to be um, in the future. And it, yeah, it feels hard to kind of go into a um, you know, we've got lots of ideas without actually being able to tell a story of where you might get to. But the only person that I've known that's ever done that is Paul Callahan, the Lives Korean Facebook account wants to know. That was where it was just like amazing to people that spot him behind that. They understood it in a very short um term, you know, words, and it really activated people because it was new and fresh. And I think that, you know, your point is that um, well, I think the point is that, you know, that's necessary. For you to basically tell the ideal concept. And I think that this is actually going much um, earlier down the, you know, before you get to that place. And I know um, Paul was um, in Cambridge for three months thinking about New Zealand, and he said he could never have come up with that line if he hadn't been outside of New Zealand talking to professors in, in the UK at the time and being in that space. So I, I think there is a there is a case for that kind of affection and high level, and that those are really special people. Um, and you know, power to them. This is like a really, I would say, a very beginning part of the process. The thing that we that I did want to, I thought was interesting, which is in the long read, um, we've got a section called factors that influence um, selection of the big policy um, actions and ideas. And that was because we suddenly realized that Gorilla and I, when we were sort of going through this process, we actually had some quite well-formed and quite common views on things, which is probably, um, you've probably got the views on them and I'm copying them, but do you know what I mean? It, we, but when you think about it, 
is that so it's things about you know should government be big or small um should we be, be you know trying to be anti-fragile or should we be being resilient what's our risk appetite like are we ever are we prepared to you know you know push down so that we, we suddenly realized that we were having these discussions but really underneath was this whole kind of layer of decisions that we had either made or were making in making these choices so we'd already what do you say almost um uh basically on reflection we realized that we were bringing a lot more into our judgments than we perhaps had initially and we were trying to be critical and identifying those so the thing with the call was for Callan was he was a physicist right so he looked at things very analytically and very um looked he i remember talking about putting new zealand under the microscope and, and you know basically trying to understand the dna and how to test it and what kind of methods so he had a very scientific way of looking at it. so for him that was his base upon which he then came up with that idea i don't know if that's helpful but i was very aware that that was you know perhaps the start of his time in cambridge was actually trying to do this but, you know, they're probably, they're probably very different parts of the journey. Um, but you might have a Yeah, I want to, to add one thing. Uh, of course, you didn't have a chance to uh, read it and reflect on it. But uh, in Action Plan 7, which is about governance, actually the first point that is made is precisely the point you're making, which is it's high time to have a national conversation about what kind of country we want to be. And we say only Parliament can lead that conversation as the steward of governance and for the future. And uh, we suggest that that should be the beginning, because unless a, a, a cross-parliament, parliamentary governance group, we call it, taking off their party political shirts, start engaging with the intent of the broader well-being framework, intergenerational well-being, that caring about the environment is not against business. You can't care about the environment and make a lot of wealth, and God bless you for making a lot of wealth, social cohesion and all that, right? That kind of conversation. And we also suggest linking that to the, the treaty conversation, is saying actually that provides a brilliant catalyst for having that national conversation because the treaty conversations, negotiations, co governance, or what it would look like in a multicultural society and such like. And our Maori people are brilliant storytellers. You know, they take the time to develop these stories. So it's there. But I think to Connell's point as well, a lot of these things are hidden. Maybe we should somehow find a way of just pushing them up and saying, if we were in charge of the world, these are the five things we would do. We tried not to do that because we tried to respect everything that was given to us. So I think there's a hand. Yes, please. Thoughts around, like, what I'm thinking about, and the work that does have this for the future of the country and has broken down the actions to do first, year, second, year, all the way up to the To me, the biggest tension I see um the New Zealand going forward is around those two visions are really different the conversations are so different had at one end about the government and reforms and tweaking versus like full constitutional change where everyone's belonging and like the schools behind it and the university is so present um but just at really different ends and how to have that in a sort of cohesive respectful way I think it's going to be yeah and maybe that's a moment to be I can repeat it I think, yeah, just seeing where there is actually an issue now. To say, if you have an answer to that question. Well, like, looking to what we're looking to, like, Maria, and looking to lots of education and a journey for Papua New Guinea to feel comfortable, confident, and belonging at home in this country that we live in. There's a lot of both sides about it. Um, but I think we can get there. And I think maybe a way of doing that, this is where giving voice to young people is, I think, a brilliant idea. 
because maybe we can get them to lead that conversation because after all it's their lives that we will be i will be certainly long dead by the time that conversation takes place so it, it would be lovely to um, give them the leadership and that sort of the spirit of 16 uh, voting age was not to prescribe something but to open up that conversation give the voice to the young people and uh, trust them and, and uh, let them and then let them express their opinions, but make it effective so that they don't turn their back. I think you want to say something, please. Yeah. Hi, Gerald and Wendy. Hello. Hello. Um, I feel like I'm going to contribute on a bit of a gut reaction and not on something I work on currently. Um, I guess my gut sort of feeling when I look at those topics, I feel like six of them are on the same level. They're sort of proclaiming a direction of travel and then the vote 16 one goes straight to an action level and I find that interesting because it, it looks a bit out of sync the others are like let's explore moving in this direction the other one says let's do the action and and I guess why I have a reaction to that I would be in the camp of, I've raised, not in my, my current role, but I am still a mother, I've raised four 16-year-olds, and while they are now high-functioning adults, I would not have wanted anything to be in their control at 16. And, and so I look at your, and I'm, I'm being quite serious, because I look at even my babies are now 18, and I think, and they're all very clever and pursuing lovely, wonderful things, the 18 year olds oh, I hope you change in a couple of years in some of your areas um so then I look at your actions and I think well your actions are actually really well thought out your third um how in here and again I haven't read the deeper one it really speaks to my heart I was in, involved in education for about 15 years and the civics education available in New Zealand is appalling and I feel like, not sounding arrogant, but I educated my children myself and I made sure they understood the political system of New Zealand. I made sure they understood competing political systems around the world and historically so that I felt like they were informed. And still, two or three years later, I'll ask them questions. I'm so surprised at how little they retain because they just haven't experienced anything. So I understand what you're saying. And I think, I think you capture it in one of your paragraphs. You say something about the importance of um, engaging our youth in meaningful civics education and understanding. And for me, that is so important. That is absolutely the number one. And if you can engage and educate and just show them these are all the things on offer, and this is what people have tried. And what do you think? And you get some really good educators in there so that they can choose and, and, and think freely. Action number two or three, quite a way down the track when you've got a few people through that system would be let's give them a meaningful voice and, and, and show them the power they can have. But giving most 16 year olds, and particularly I love your chainsaw quote, <laughs> I'm thinking 16 year olds are, are the ones who are most vulnerable to social media. And then we talk about giving them power. That frightens me. Although, although, <laughs> if you look internationally, yeah, what's the obvious uh, recent example of an absolutely disastrous political policy change driven by an enclosed media? It's Brexit. Which is not 16 year olds, it's yeah. 61 year olds, 61 year olds. <laughs> um, so I don't have a strong view on this, but yeah. I wouldn't necessarily assume that, that, that. Yeah. I agree about 16 year olds. I'm less sure about yeah. the rest of the population. It's actually that much. <laughs> <laughs> now, I've just I had a note from Roger who said if the audience could speak up a little bit, there's this can They are not hearing us. They're yeah. hearing us as well as we like. Yeah. So it's very good conversation. So bring it out there. Let's raise your voice just a little bit, please. Thank you. Um, on the civics in schools thing, I think it's not so much about telling people about it and teaching them, you know, the ins and outs of it. It's actually practicing it in your daily life. So actually within a school setting, you know, it's schools living out civics in action and giving 
you know, opportunities for students to be involved in the actual real decision making that you know around the way to swap rates of curriculum, all sorts of things. You know, there's models of democratic schools that seem to be this perfectly well, and people come out, you know, with very mature sort of approaches to in being involved in all sorts of discussions and, and, and actually because they've exercised that throughout, you know, from even when they were babies. You know, this can so I think it's inculcating that in a practical way, um, not just you know telling people about civics and things like that. Yeah. I pick up the really practical 16. If I was looking at that for my marketing for the year and thinking about who do we want to actually uh, read this, listen to it, think about it, what will be the first headline? It'll be mm -hmm. vote 16. And it'll just go oh, everything else. And everything else will go down to Google. Mm -hmm. Now it's probably good media for you there, like a comment box. Just <laughs> it actually screams at you. Okay, so uh, let's park that to one side. It's wonderful conversation, but there are other items such as uh, the one that uh, Wendy is so passionate about. She gives me a lecture every time I say good morning, which is her idea of establishing ecological corridors. What do you think about that? What, what is the idea there? Just huh. expand on that. Right. Okay. Well, sure. you have to say it was a, um, a talent of conservation um, by a gentleman wrote it in about 1970. So it's not that new idea, but it's becoming, I think, a more relevant and useful idea in terms of um, thinking of our uh, massive um, coastal area, thinking about climate change, thinking about the ability to. Um, cope with massive amounts of water um, and floods and also dealing with massive amount of heat. And um, so the idea is uh, that you would create um, these corridors, but really what an effect they are is you would be investing and in putting effort into creating spongy coastal areas and ways for flora and fauna to move up and down. So we have a geographical advantage in that we um, fix on planet this way, which means that foreign corner can move up and down depending on heat and moisture and whatever. Um, we've removed a lot of the sunglasses that actually, um, in our country. Um, we've developed it, we've put urban housing, um, and a really big move globally now is this concept of spongy cities. Um, once again, highly relevant within the last three or four weeks. <laughs> and this idea that they are using the ecosystem that comes from the university and are trying to apply it to cities so that you can create systems like um, moths and things that actually will, will absorb water and um, not run, which is what is, what is the predominant thing that happens when you have concrete tunnels. So it's this idea that the ecological corridor is something like they haven't been done, where they've actually put a made a requirement in the constitution and I'm going to yes I think 60 percent of the land acts must be so it's this idea that you actually embrace the ecosystem to be part of the spiritual and this will become a part of the I think it's fantastic completely appropriate very fits the brain solves climate change creates Hold of employment, creates, looks after our biodiversity, gives us a massive um, ability around biodiversity. Um, so I, I, I fail not to see a win win. And I think most New Zealanders are environmentalists at heart, love getting outdoors. You know, you know, we can talk about it for hours, and the rules quite right to um, be closing off now. But, no, just for like you said, you said enough about your passion. <laughs> Any feedback on that? Does it resonate at all? Any concerns? So what's the impact of the next part? Yeah, so the idea is that you've got different protections between the national parks. That's not very smart. So. so the idea is that you have your high level protection area and then you make your corridors. And the corridors, and I'm going to be able to answer this question more specifically in a couple of months, um, is actually to understand exactly how, what types of protections they put on the corridors. Um, and so it's part of their culture and religion. So my, my immediate 
nature creation is interface telling. And the key issue for our personal biodiversity is critters, not habitat. Um, we've got a bunch of natural railway routes that are, are, are scattered in the paper. One of the low ones was from the desert from our uh, point of view. But if we're going to put corridors and we're going to do anything, they need to be matched by predator control. And the big risk I would say would be pushing something through this. Um, they come at the expense, comes at the expense of other things like predator control. So that, that, that to me is the huge risk. This would have to be in addition to, yeah, and with a step up, so yeah. including corridor, yeah. if, it, if it doesn't, if it doesn't, yeah. Yeah. so I've, I've only said the Dwayne College diplomas and have pointed that the piece will get there no matter what. So, so it's like, I mean, they will, they will move across. Yeah, it's not that it's not that the yeah. piece will move across it. It's yeah. that if we do this and we're not coming in front of control, we're even yeah, going to scrap this resource okay. in future expansion of predator control. To me, the net biodiversity impact would be uh, ambivalence. I think one of the, the big positive initiatives I've seen over the past 10 years was pretty frequency as a, a, a vision. So you would want it not to trip over that. Oh, you would want to actually go to one. Yeah. And yeah, now I'm very. The other thing that led to mind is it's nice. So we had this tradition of we saved our mountains to be the watersheds that we. From. There is a nice sort of analogy there, and to say it's a good half the job back when we did that, but actually, we forgot to save the other end of the system, which are the spongy bits which soak up. The, and there's something about that which I don't get the which for corridors, but I get the talking about it, but I think is, is worth saying. Sort of our ancestors had half the vision, but they missed the bit, they missed what you know, the, 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 they'd say we would pay from. They didn't really think through what was done to run this. This conversation is um, extremely precious because we were talking, Wendy, what is the whole purpose of this? The whole idea is pick any big action point and ask yourself, is this the right thing to focus on? What is it trying to achieve? What's the major objection, objective and why? And then look at what we're proposing, like you're saying, but in our context, actually, what you're proposing is only half of it, and maybe it could be harmful to other things, and to explore the conversation that way. So that's why I pleaded with you, and you're doing it anyway, is to say, are we focusing on the right big issues? And then get into the how and say, okay, that's fantastic point. Let's make sure that we differentiate between predator versus habitat and all that. Kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, please. And, and it was probably our last question. Is so it last yeah, question. Sorry. Last question. You have the privilege of asking the right. Thank you. Um, so just pulling out here, like in terms of the vision, I think it's quite clear here that it's a sustainable future. And um, on that note, I might comment that um, if that isn't enough for us, then that could be more about our um, lack of understanding of what that is, that might give us concern to want to know a bit more about what that is. But to, to say a couple of things more about the word sustainable, sustainable means living. And I'm not entirely sure how often we connect that fact. So we will not have a sustainable world if it's not a living world. And then that begs a, a few questions, which would be, um, how many of us understand living sufficiently for us to be to be and to do in the world in ways that contribute to that or add potential to that? And if we don't, how could we possibly ever, as an individual, let alone as a country, do the work that leads to that living and hence um, sustainable world? So if, if I was to say one thing about it, it would be to give attention to our individual and collective lack of understanding of what we're actually talking about when we're talking about a sustainable world. Because I, I cannot imagine us getting there without an increased understanding of this. So let's put some, some work into that. Well. 
No, and then this is this is so beautiful. I cannot control myself anymore. But uh, the whole point about the conversation, you're hundred percent spot on, is to have a conversation about what do we mean by sustainable intergenerational well-being. That is the conversation we want to have without going into ideological knickknacks, right? And that's precisely the point. It's not just about hugging trees. It's, uh, it's, uh, it has all these other dimensions and what, what kind of ecosystem, let's use buzzwords, will be a platform for sustainable well-being broadly defined. And that's the conversation in a governance sense, the first conversation we need to have. The country says, yeah, I like it. This is, I, I, and then we can always have our political debates on how we achieve X, Y, Z. But we don't have that picture. We are divided. That's the big, big, that's the big idea. How are we going to have that conversation? When? And the treaty one is brilliant in that sense because I, when I meditate on it, that's probably the best door through which we can have this conversation. Because it touches on all elements of it, whether it's social cohesion, equity, material prosperity, environmental issues, democracy, it touches on all of those. Okay, enough of me, please. <laughs> Was this conversation that? Yeah, I think I would just add sustainable sustainability or sustainable management was an amazing leap forward that we didn't have before to so not um, because that enabled us to have something to put in that space that we didn't think so. And that's you know, 1987, I think, but um, yeah, it's it's um, really got pity it's been taken out of the RMA actually at the goal at the moment, but we'll see how that goes. Okay, um, really interesting exercise, and um, I hope it is um, a useful and interesting type of people in life that have been uh, particularly for me. And it's um, been such a pleasure to work with Daryl, and I'm hoping he will return um, that, um, and, and continue to work with us. But it was just an amazing process. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming. You've got the next parts of the process, we will take what we've got, but we would love to hear more from you. So um at any stage please um send us emails, texts, whatever, whenever, that would be fantastic. Talk to patrons, um, or me directly that would be I should say that um uh, because she invited me three times to say it, and I wanted to say it anyway, that it has been an absolute delight and pleasure to work with Wendy and her wife at team. <laughs> they kept me uh, young and beautiful for the last four months, no stress. It's all good. It's uh, I love it. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, absolutely. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you me. very much for joining us, everybody. Yeah.